everyone. Greetings uh, to all of you at Kentwood Alliance Church and to those of you who may be listening in who are not from Kentwood Alliance Church. I just want to say thanks for joining us. Uh, this is our YouTube broadcast where we are uh, in this time where the virus is going around. This is our opportunity to get together and to uh, have a chance to just go to the Word together. And so we're doing that online and uh, this is our second one. I'm excited about it, and uh, so just thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope you're blessed by what we have for you today. Uh, my name is Pastor Garrett, if I hadn't mentioned that already, and uh, today we're going to be looking more into the book of Matthew, which we've been doing as a church, and we're going to continue to do that. But first, I want to make just a couple of quick announcements for our church body, uh, just so you know. we uh, Every year we have this uh, Good Friday, joint Good Friday service that we do with Deer Park uh, in town, and you know what? We're... We're not wanting to miss that, and so we're going to go ahead and do a joint Deer Park Kentwood uh, Good Friday service together on, uh, I think it's the 10th of April, uh, but it's going to be different. We're not going to just be um, coming together as a church. Obviously, we can't do that right now, but uh, we've got kind of a neat thing set up. It's like a drive-in movie, except uh, you're going to be doing it church style, so you, we, we want to invite you to come, get in your cars drive to Deer Park for a 10.30 uh, service, a.m. Friday, and you drive in, and you tune in, I think it's to 88.5, and you're going to be able to pick up uh, what we're doing. We're going to have a, a stage out there. there. There'll be a worship team, and uh, I will be able to bring the Word of God to us. And so uh, you just sit in your cars and kind of take part in your vehicles. It's kind of a neat way of gathering without really touching each other or getting into each other's space. So we're going to do that. Mark your calendars for that. And uh, before we jump in, you know, I thought, let's pray. Uh, if you could join me, for those of you who are watching, let's pray together. I want to pray for our frontline nurses. we got many nurses in our church and people who are on the front line working right now uh, in the hospitals and such. And so uh, if you would join me, let's pray and ask God to guide us through his word and uh, also pray for these folks as well. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together online like this again. And Lord, I pray, first of all, that you would be glorified and that whatever we say here is of your truth and that people would know uh, that it's from your word. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would use this time uh, to teach us from your word and to, by your Holy Spirit, uh, transform us and continue to disciple us and equip us and, uh, and comfort us and help us to know the gospel more deeply. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And, Lord, we do want to lift up those who are working at the hospital and uh, those who are frontline workers, the nurses, the staff, the, the doctors, everyone involved. Lord, would you give them strength? Would you give them peace? Would you give them what they need in order to, uh, to work well in these days and to heal the sick? And so, Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, be with us now as we jump into your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I am once again grateful that we uh, get to come together and release this content to all of you at Kentwood Church, as well as to, as I said, many folks who are tuning in to this YouTube channel who are not people who typically attend our church. And, uh, you know, I've been encouraged this last week. There's so many people that have, have shared the video with others and, and uh, sent it out to people, family, friends. And, uh, you know, it's been a real good encouragement. People have been commenting on how much they're thankful for that. So... Great. If you want to share this video, share it away. Uh, you'll also maybe know and, and notice that our technology is getting better. We're getting better at this technology thing. And so uh, the videos are getting better. The quality of the video gets better. I'm gonna, uh, there's some editing this time on the video. Um, you may have la last week, you may have noticed there was some, some uh, breakups in the video. Well, that's mainly just because we were live streaming. And so that's why uh, it came through like that. So today... We're going to be looking at the next passage in the book of Matthew, and that's Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. And so that's right, there's only three verses in our, uh, in our, in our, in our passage today. It's a place where we can plant our hearts, and, uh, but I assure you, there's a lot in these three verses that we're going to look at. Uh, this passage is relevant, as Scripture is always relevant, but especially as we face the current times we're in. One of the very important questions that I think always comes up when there's things going on in our world that are crazy is, what is going on? <laughs> what is God doing? 
and maybe what is the meaning behind all, all of this? And, and people start asking the bigger questions about where is God, if God is real, and those kinds of questions. And what I find is that at this point, everyone becomes professional interpreters of the times. I don't know if you've been getting this, but everyone thinks they know. Uh, what these times mean and what the plan of God is that's unfolding in front of us and people become expert predictors of prophecy in the New Old Testament and everyone seems to have a, a gift suddenly of discernment and I've watched as people online start to declare themselves prophets of God who have come to send and shed light on everything uh, that's going on around us. Uh, folks, I just want to say it has always been the case. It happens every time there's a major global situation politically and so on. And although I, I believe that God is sovereign in all this and that nothing occurs outside of his hand and outside of his work, um, his working through it, we, we have to be careful in our enthusiasm not to dictate to God what God should be or is doing. We need to submit ourselves to God's plan and not man's plan. And so that is really the crux of the passage today, God's plan versus man's plan. And I believe that God has a plan for all of us and, uh, and this world and this situation that we're in, and it's a good plan. And so you and I, we don't, need to, we don't need to give him a new plan. He's got a plan for all this. I know he does. And uh, we need to come in line with whatever that is. And so with that in spirit in mind, I, I want and I desire to know God and His will and who God is, if we desire that, uh, then where do we turn? Well, we, we turn to Scripture. And so let's do that. If you have a Bible with you, I'd ask you to please turn to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23, and we're going to be reading it together. Um, this passage really picks up right where we left off last week. Peter had just confessed Jesus as God and as Savior, and Christ declared in the emphatic way that he did that he will build his church and that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Such an encouraging reminder in this time. And that the keys of the kingdom have been given to the church. That's the other thing that was mentioned there. That is the gospel has been given. And so from there, our passage is going to continue. So again, if you have your Bibles, open them up. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. It says this. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You know, what an interesting passage that we get to look at together. Essentially, you have a picture here of God's plan up against kind of man's plan, man's idea of how things should go. You know, Jesus is bringing the picture here of God's plan, and Peter is the one who thinks that his plan, man's plan, is much better. And so, uh, I mean, oh boy, was, was he wrong and surprised? No, we're not surprised by that reality. And so it starts off by saying in verse 21 that from this time on, Jesus, he, he starts to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and be killed and on the third day be raised. Okay, so he's trying to teach them, this is what's going to happen. This is what God has in mind. So there it is. In the midst of the journey, Jesus was on, was on with his disciples. He has decided at this point to declare to them God's plan. This is what God's doing. This is what Jesus must do. Okay? He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer and be tortured under the hand of these religious rulers. And, of course, the Romans, we, we know that. And he must be killed and raised to life on the third day. You know, it's interesting. Easter's coming as we hit this passage. It's fitting time that we start looking at this one here. So Jesus, he lays out the whole work of the gospel that he must do. It will be hard. It will be horrible. It will involve suffering. It will involve pain. 
And make no mistake, it's all part of God's plan. Okay, it'll involve suffering, it'll involve pain, and it's all part of God's plan. I think it's really hard for us to stomach the truth that sometimes God's plan involves very difficult things. Pain, yes. Suffering, yes. Loss, yes. Sacrifice, yes. But out of it comes something very good, something eternal, something that needs to be there, something that is, is, is just very good to have. So, so this is the plan that Jesus unfolds to the disciples going forward. Jesus only mentioned his death one other time. That was in Matthew 9.15. Okay, so before this, he hadn't talked about it much. And he only references his resurrection one other time. That's Matthew 12, uh, 39 through 40. So this is new info for them, for the most part. But from now on, he will continually teach them about these things that he must do. And so he's repeating it over and over again. And the question is, did they get it? Did they understand it despite all the teachings? Not really. I mean, what happens when Jesus is arrested and crucified? They scatter. They scatter. They're shocked. They're surprised. How about when he rose from the dead? Nope. They're still shocked and surprised. So even though Jesus teaches them over and over again, uh, they don't seem to get truly what this is going to look like. And you know, if there's one thing I can say for, for sure as someone who teaches the Bible often, it is that it takes many, many times to hear something in order to learn it. And even, even then, sometimes you have to experience it to really understand it. And so perhaps, you know, we need to just make sure we have our ears open and we're listening and attentive, especially when God is speaking to us and teaching us from his word. We really need to be attentive and, and open. A lot of people take notes and write things down to try and remember things. So the plan is given by Jesus to the disciples. The plan is necessary. Okay, There's no other way for this to go down. Jesus has to walk this line that's been set out before him. This is God's plan. It's hard and it speaks to a reality. And the reality is this. There is no Christianity without the cross. Okay, There is no Christianity without the cross. There's no salvation in Christ. There's no church being built. There's no grace and mercy imparted to sinners without the cross. This is the will of God, that Jesus, the Son of God, should die for sinners. It's his plan. It's not the plan of man. It's not the plan of Satan. This is God's plan from the start. Even the hard things are God's plan. Uh, Isaiah 53.10 gives us an insight. We read it. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. I mean, whose sovereign hand worked out this plan? It was God's. He has put him to grief. God the Father has crucified his son, and his son willingly went. If you look at John 19, 10 through 11, it speaks uh, even more of God's hand in the plan. And in this, it's Jesus is sitting before Pilate, and Pilate is wondering what to do with Jesus. Do I crucify him? Do I not crucify him? And we read this in John 19. It says, So Pilate said to Jesus, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. So not only did Pilate have authority to kill Jesus, but he had God-given authority to kill Jesus. This is God's plan. It's not man's plan. It's not Pilate's plan. It's God's plan. Jesus had to die for sinners. He had to become a man and die. Well, why? Well, because the wages of sin is death. That's what the law says. That's God's law. That's the price that is paid for sin. That's the penalty. And Jesus died to pay that price so that sinners could be saved. And so that's why this plan is the only plan. It satisfies the law. It is justice fulfilled. 
And I would turn you at this point back to what we read last week, that Christ would build his church and even the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Take one more step. You know, some people interpret that. The word there is often translated the gates of Hades, which in Greek means the place of death. And so even death will not prevail against the church. Satan will not prevail against the church. Christ's death will not be the end of it because in three days he defeats death and rises again. So there's this horrible plan. It's a good plan, but it's a horrible journey of suffering and death that needs to happen. And it's God's plan. And at this point, someone listening to this might say, well, that would not be my plan. I mean, he's God. Couldn't he do whatever he wanted? It just doesn't seem to jive with our senses and, and what should happen. And so God's plan is to win kind of by losing, to win by sacrifice, to win by suffering. And I want, to, I want you to notice the amazing good that came from the most heinous and terrible thing that has ever happened to this world. In all of humanity and history, of all the atrocities and terrible evils that our world has experienced, none of them compare to the cross. Okay, you might say, well... What about, what about Auschwitz and things like that? What are you saying? That the cross was worse than that? That is what I'm saying. The salvation of sinners came at the mockery and the torture and the death of the most beautiful, innocent, righteous, loving creator of the universe, our God. The one who has created us and loved us and created all the beauty and goodness and, and, and created Everything that is a source of, he's the source of life and all that is good. It was him that we murdered. On his shoulders lay the full weight of my sin and yours. And the wrath of God was poured out, not on you and I, but on him. An innocent man, on God himself. So God poured out his wrath on God instead of us. God poured out his wrath on God instead of us. And people dare to call him wicked or unloving. You might ask, well, what is God doing right now? Why all the suffering? Why all the challenging situations? Why is the world coming apart right now? Why doesn't God just change it all? Well, because God has a plan. And he has a, a purpose and a will, and he is unfolding it. And it's good, even if realized through very difficult circumstances. Isaiah 46, 9, he says, I am God. He says, my counsel will stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. So God has a plan. Now, the problem comes when we say this. If I were God, I would do it differently. And this is exactly where we mess up. This is where Peter messes up. Let's, let's read the next verse and see what Peter does. What does Peter do after hearing of God's plan? It says in verse 22, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. So Peter, thinking he knows better than God, pulls Jesus aside here and rebukes him. This is a very strong, sharp criticism. He says, no, this whole thing about suffering at the hands of the elders and the priests and dying, it's just not going to happen. And so this term, far be it from you, really is the same as saying, have mercy on yourself. And, he, and so he says, this will never happen. Such an arrogant, prideful moment for Peter. I mean, Peter could not see how the suffering and the death of the Son of God, and the author of life itself, could possibly be part of God's plan. And so Peter thinks that he knows the will of God better than God himself. I mean, remember, he had just confessed that Jesus was God in verse 16. And now he thinks he can tell God what to do. He dares to rebuke God. I would suggest that we have a similar tendency at times to do the same thing. We, we wonder, what is God doing? And we think our circumstance is just not, it's just not okay. Something has to change. It might be difficult, but maybe God has a plan for it. 
You know, in your prayers, do you dictate to God what he ought to do? You know, maybe make sure we're praying the scriptures because praying the scriptures is a great way to make sure we're praying in God's will. In your thoughts, do you tell him what he ought to be doing? Or have you humbly submitted yourself to his will, uh, praying, God, move the mountain if it be your will, and if not, then give me the strength to climb it. Whatever it is, your will be done. That's how we were taught by Jesus to pray, your will be done. So you have to know what Peter was asking of Jesus here. He was asking Jesus to abandon the path of the cross and the resurrection. Essentially, he was telling him to abandon the gospel. And by dictating this to Jesus, he was asking for his own damnation. Because if he does not go to that cross, then nobody would be saved from the wrath to come, Peter included. So sometimes when we ask God to change the situation, sometimes when we want God to do it our way, we're in a place of asking him to change something that God's doing that is very important. Peter here had what we would call thoughtless enthusiasm. Our good intentions can be oh so very wrong. <laughs> we're so proud at times that we feel wronged unless God approves of, of what, what pleases us. Sometimes we invent a God of our own ego, a, a God who oddly enough agrees with everything we do and never comes against anything we are. Isn't that odd? <laughs> so how do we avoid that pitfall? Lots of enthusiasm, but using it for such a wrong purpose. By going to God's word for direction. My point is this, go ahead, be passionate. Be passionate, but be passionately biblical. Be passionately biblical. We need to be asking, what is God's plan? Not our plan, but His. We cannot let our flesh dictate to God. You know, John Calvin, the great theologian, he said this, there is no more ravening beast than the wisdom of the flesh. And so he says here, Christ attacks it so fiercely that he beats it down with an iron hammer so that we may learn to be wise from the word of God alone. And that is indeed what Peter experiences. Last verse here, verse 23, look what Jesus does. It says, he turns and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. Here we see the iron hammer, as Calvin put it, come down on Peter. I mean, this is a striking rebuke. It's a stinging rebuke to Peter. He says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. This is a serious strike, comparing him to Satan himself. You know, the only other time that Jesus makes this kind of remark is, if you can remember, in the desert when Jesus is being tempted by Satan. And so in Matthew 4, 9, Satan takes Jesus to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world, kingdoms of the world and then we read Satan, or, or Jesus saying to Satan, or sorry, back up, we read Satan saying to Jesus, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus says to him, Be gone, Satan. So get behind me, Satan, is typically the same phrase. It means go away. And so he says to Peter, Go away, Satan, in the same manner that he said it in the desert during his temptation. So Jesus is saying to Peter, This thing that you're saying is Satan's logic, not God's. This attempt to remove me from God's plan of salvation is really satanic. The, the whole purpose of the temptation in the desert was to get Jesus to give up his mission, to leave God's plan. And indeed, Peter's insistence is that he leave God's plan. To go to Jerusalem and to suffer, die, and be resurrected. None of that is what Peter is saying. So we can have the best intentions and yet be Satan's lackeys. We need to be on guard from such things. Is what you're about to do consistent with God's truth, consistent with Scripture? Is it bowing the knee to what God has said already? And you know what Jesus says next? He says, Peter, you are a hindrance to me. 
This is literally this literally means that Peter is in this moment a stumbling block and a temptation to Jesus. How? You say, well, how is that possible? Jesus is God. Well, I'll tell you how. Jesus may be 100% God, but he is here also 100% human as well. So I want you to make no mistake. Jesus was concerned about what he had to do. Jesus was concerned about what was coming. Jesus knew that he had to suffer. Jesus knew that he had to die on the cross. Jesus knew that he had to bear the weight of sin. The wrath of God was going to be poured out upon him, and he was going to have to taste death for the first time ever. And like any person who's about to be tortured to death, the temptation to abandon it all and leave it behind is strong. And so he says to Peter, I don't need this right now. I don't need you tempting me to give up this mission. This is what Satan did in the desert. And you need to know, Peter, that by doing this, you hinder me. So Jesus said in the garden while he was sweating drops of blood, he said, Lord, if there's any way, take this cup from me. I mean, Jesus in his humanness needed encouragement, not rebuke. He needed to be cheered on and moved forward. Not that he needs anything, but in his human flesh, he needed that. And I think it's fitting to warn us here again that we're not driven forward by misguided enthusiasm, by our unbiblical philosophy. It's possible to be passionate in ministry and to be scripturally wrong. And this was Peter's problem. He did not heed the voice of God, and in his enthusiasm, he really became a hindrance to the church because he was not exercising his passion according to God's will and plan and teaching. And so we too should not, in our enthusiasm, fail to rightly know God and discern the word and what he says and thus and thus hinder the ministry and mission that we're on, or worse yet, derail the church that we're in. And of course, the last thing Jesus says is this to Peter, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is indeed the problem that undergirds it all. We so often think, act, and make choices based on our own man-made wisdom, on our own man-made plans, and on our flesh's desires. We often want the easy route, the comfortable route, the route of success, the popular route, the culturally relevant route. So we act according to what we think and not what Scripture says. We do not always pursue the truth as our only standard for life and godliness. And we're prone to look at what is right in front of us and decide based on our immediate circumstances and not based on the eternal picture. Okay, there's a difference between what you see in front of you right now and the eternal picture of what God is doing. And what we need to be seeking is God's point of view on things, the eternal picture, the heavenly perspective, not our point of view. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we think about our circumstances, we need to be putting our thoughts on things that are above. And sometimes that means asking the right questions. Here's some questions you can ask in any situation. What does God hope to do in all this? What does God expect of me now? How can I serve him in this time? And what in this time should I value? While you're sitting at home right now, quarantined, what is it that you should value? What is it you should be doing? Um, how are you serving him in this time? Apply it to this whole virus situation. Or maybe you're one of the many folks who have lost their job. Ask the question, what does God hope to do in all this? What does God expect of me right now? How can I serve him in this? And what in this time should I value? And really that's a question of what is it that God values? 
Colossians chapter 3, 1 to 2, kind of wraps this up and says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above, where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Okay, setting your mind on things that are above and not the things that are on earth. Good words for us right now. Good words. Think bigger than just viruses and economy. Think eternally. What is God doing right now in the world? How many people are rethinking about eternity? Rethinking about what life is really all about. So here we have God's plan versus man's plan. In our passion, may we climb onto God's page and seek His will and His plan from Scripture and act accordingly. Okay, His plan, His will from Scripture and act accordingly. I want to end with this quick story from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I've already mentioned it. I'm reading it with my kids. We're loving it. It's a great book. In that book, there's this character, Christian, and we're at the part where it's now looking at his wife, Christiana. And it says the character Christiana has been sent out on this journey by Christ to the celestial city. It's heaven. They're on their journey towards heaven. And she stops along the way at a house. And it's a place of rest for weary Christian travelers. And as she is there, she's shown kind of different places around the house and in the yard. And in one place, there's a hen with her chicks uh, under her wings. And they are to be a picture of how God cares for his children. But then they go out into the yard and there's a man standing there in the yard. He's hunched over. His back is hunched over. His head is looking to the ground. He, he can't look up. He, and he has a rake in his hand. And he's raking the mud and the straw and the dust from the ground. He never lifts his head. He just stays looking down and raking at the mud. Beside him is a person holding a crown, a glorious, wonderful crown. And this man with the mud rake, he just never looks up. His eyes are always down in the mud. And he's really a picture of a person whose eyes are always looking at the things of earth, always looking at the circumstances, and always looking at the things that are really not going to last, things that are but just dust and, and everything in the end, our houses, our jobs, our health. Even, even that, even these mortal bodies, they're going to pass away. They're gone in a moment. It will be like dust and mud. And this man, he just, he keeps working and raking and looking down at the mud. And the terrible reality is this, that if he would only look up, that if he would only lift his head, he would see the crown he would know that there are greater things than just dust and straw and mud. There is a crown of glory. There is a crown for his head. If he would only look up, there's an eternity. And all he's got to do is look up, just lift his head and see that there's so much more to put our eyes on, much more valuable things. My friends, there is our plan and what we would like to see. And then there is God's plan. And his plan is much better than our plan. And in this time, I want to encourage you, look up. Look up. Don't be like the guy with his head down in the mud, looking at that. Do not dwell on the mud and the straw. Look up. God is doing something. God is doing much greater things than, than what we're seeing with our, with our eyeballs. His plan is glorious. And he has gone to the cross, and he has risen again. And he is building his church. So can we get on board with whatever he's doing right now? Can we be asking the right questions and have the right kind of perspective right now? I don't know what God's doing in terms of when he's coming back or, or any of those kind of end times things. I'm, I'm not even going to start to guess there. It doesn't matter. He says, be ready. Are we ready? Be ready. And in the meantime, let's, let's continue to crawl on to his plan. The keys of the kingdom have been given. Let us go and be uh, the people of God that we've been called to be. And I ask you, if you're 
watching this and you don't know the Lord Jesus, you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, I just, I pray that you would, you would get down on your knees and pray, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior and look up from the mud and the dirt uh, once, once, uh, and receive the crown that he has for you. Let's pray before we, uh, before we sign off. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message. Lord, we have a picture here of your plan and a picture of Peter bringing his plan. And in the end, um, we need to not be looking at the uh, things of this world and the things of man, but we need to be looking towards you and your plan for this time. And so, Lord, help us to crawl onto your page and to know what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign and at work, that even through this hard stuff, you are, you are looking after your people. And, uh, Lord, we're, we're thankful that we have a God who cares for us, um, who never leaves us nor forsakes us, even in the most difficult of times. So, Lord, thank you for this time. I pray you be with the rest of us and all of us as we go into Sunday and into a time with our families and as we're a part as a congregation continue to uh, help us to pick up the phone and to be with each other and to care for one another and to care for our neighbors in any way we can right now Lord thank you for the blessing of your word um, we pray you be glorified in our lives in Jesus name we pray amen all right well thanks everyone for signing on I hope you have a, a good time if you uh, need anything, please let me know. And otherwise, I'm praying for you all. Uh, may you be blessed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I once was dead in sin, alone and hopeless. A child of wrath, I walked condemned.